First, I want to thank the Simons Foundation for inviting me to speak here. It's, of course, a pleasure and a great honor to be here. Does this thing work? There's some kind of a feedback. Yeah, but they are feel, I hear some feedback. No, you hear fine? It reminds me, I gave a talk once, and I asked, can everybody hear me? And somebody said, I can hear you all right, but I'll be very happy to change seat with somebody who cannot hear you. <laughs> so I thank the Simons Foundation for inviting me to speak here. It's really a great honor. And I thank you for the generous introduction. And most of all, I thank all of you for coming in this weather. This is real dedication to science, and I appreciate it. I understand we have some kind of a mixed audience here. In fact, I got three contradicting reports about the background of the audience. And I'll try to cater to every need. So hopefully, I'll manage to have something for everybody, which of course means that every single person will have a lot of the talk that he or she is not happy with. And that's typical. So I brought you here with the title, Where is Fundamental Physics Heading? And I must start with a disclaimer. I don't know. I don't know because we cannot really predict the future. Nobody can. Whoops. So nobody can predict the future. And we do not know what will be discovered. And this is the reason science is so exciting, because we are constantly we are constantly surprised. I think it's better if I stand here. We are constantly surprised by the outcome. We don't know what experiments will yield. That's the reason we perform experiments. If we knew what the outcome of the experiment would be, if we were sure about that, there would be no reason to perform the experiment. We just know the answer. And we are constantly surprised either by scientific experiment, experiments with surprising results or with new theoretical insights. So I don't know what the future will be, but Given that, the goal of this lecture is to share with you some of the excitement of, that we could expect in the coming years. But in order to understand the future, we should really understand the past and learn some lessons from the past. So I'll have some description of the past and the present. And toward the end of the talk, I'll talk about the future. So like the news, I'd like to start with a quick summary. So today we'll review the past and the present. And like the news, we'd like to start with the summary. We are in an unusual and almost unprecedented situation in physics. And the situation is that we have two standard models. One of them describes physics at very short distances. Here it would be the physics of particle physics. And the second standard model is the standard model of cosmology. And it describes the physics of the whole of the universe as a whole, describes the physics at very long distances. And these two models are extremely successful. And we do not know of anything that contradicts them. And I'll be a lot more explicit about this later in the talk. They work extremely well in the range of parameters that they were designed to work in. And that has led some people to say that this is the end of science, because we really understand everything. We have these models that work extremely well. Some people even say that there is a crisis in physics. There is a crisis because we understand any, everything, and there is nothing else to be discovered. I really, really disagree with these two statements. They're completely wrong, and I'll try to convince you of that. And in particular, there are excellent arguments that there must be new physics beyond these two models. The physics of these two models is incomplete, and there must be physics beyond them. So this is the one slide summary of the talk. There will be another more sophisticated summary toward the end. So going back to history, we'd like to see, have we ever seen anything like that? And the answer is yes. And that happened at the end of the 19th century. During the 19th century, physicists understood the theory of heat. This was thermodynamics. And they understood the theory of light and electromagnetism. We had Newton's law and Maxwell's equations. And physicists were very happy. And some physicists thought that is the end of science. There is nothing else to be discovered. In fact, there is a story of the famous British physicist, Lord Kelvin, the same Kelvin from the degrees. And the title of his lecture that he gave in 1900 was 19th century clouds over the dynamical theory of heat and light. 
The two clouds that he referred to are the michelson morley experiment that eventually led to the theory of relativity. And the second is the black body radiation. This was a puzzle in quantum mechanics, which was one of the roots of quantum mechanics. And one could take two different attitudes. And people, in fact, took these two different attitudes toward the end of the 19th century. One is, we have a beautiful theory. There is a crisis in physics. Everything is understood. There is nothing else to be understood. And there are these two little details that we don't understand, but that's not really important. The second attitude, which now we know was the right one, was these two clouds over the horizon are the first sign of a big storm, of a revolution in physics. And since this is the first sign, we should really zoom on it, we should focus on it, view these two, I, two ex, this experiment and this theoretical question as clues to the next step. So the fact that we have a theory that works almost perfectly and there are a few details we don't understand, we should really focus on these details because they are giving us the clues to the next step. And I think here it happened very rapidly, this 1900. And within 30 years, quantum mechanics and special relativity and general relativity were completely understood. And it's completely clear that it was a mistake to ignore these, uh, these uh, two signs. Now, some people interpreted that, as I said, that physics was almost over. In fact, it's commonly referred to say that Kelvin himself also said that physics was over. There are only these two clouds. But if you read his talk very carefully, you see that the opposite is exact. Exactly the opposite is true. Kelvin really advocated focusing on these two clouds as being the, new, the first sign of the new physics that will be coming. So what we'll discuss today is the, the clouds of today, those little clouds which I think should be viewed as clues to the next breakthrough. And I think we are on the very verge of a big revolution, perhaps on the scale of quantum mechanics and relativity. So there will be a theme in this talk of how research progresses. And the theme is as follows. We start usually by collecting data. This is very important. We collect a lot of data. And we parameterize this data by finding a pattern. This is the next step. We find a pattern in the data. And instead of having tons and tons of numbers, we see some pattern. And we manage to describe the data we have using a small number of parameters, which we still have to measure. Like we have an equation, and the equation has some coefficients. We don't know how to predict the coefficients. We measure them. And then using the equation with these coefficients, we predict a lot more data. So these are the parameters that we refer to. The next step in the evolution of a theory is to understand the underlying reason for the pattern. So the pattern is something that we ex found experimentally. The next step, we understand why it is true. What is the origin of the pattern? In the next step, we still have to understand these remaining parameters. Where did they come from? So we collect more data. And then we have a do loop going back to the beginning. And the cycle goes on. And there are many examples of this theme or this sequence of events in the history of science. And I'd like to go here through two examples just to demonstrate it. And also, we'll extract some very interesting lessons from history. So the first example I would like to talk about is the motion of the planets. People were interested in the motion of the planets from ancient time, starting with Babylonia. This is the map of the sky. And then by a bunch of Greek astronomers who explored the astronomy. And they collected a lot of data. And they understood the planets and the motion of the planets. And they summarized their data by the fact that all the stars move in circles. That was not a good enough approximation. So they added another circle on top of the circle. That was still not a good approximation. Then they added more circles. This theory was known as epicycles. And they managed to summarize a lot of data using these epicycles. So this is the step of collecting the data. The next step was identifying the pattern. This happened several centuries later, about a thousand years later, maybe more, by Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler, and others. And they looked for a pattern in all the numbers, trying to have a picture which is a little bit simpler, more conceptual. And they came up with the heliocentric model. We are not at the center. The sun is at the center. And we are just a planet moving around the sun. And this was very nice, because 
now using a small number of parameters, like the radii of the orbits of the planets, we can replace and we can predict all the many numbers that the Greek knew about. We can replace, using the heliocentric model, we can replace the tons of numbers that they had before with a small number of parameters. So this is clearly progress. We explain everything in terms of a simple pattern. So Kepler himself was very interested in these parameters that he didn't understand, the sizes of the orbits. And he was fascinated by math and physics, and he had a beautiful theory connecting physics and mathematics. At the time, Kepler knew of six planets, and he wanted to tie that with the fact that there are five platonic solids, the platonic solids that the ancient Greek were interested in. So his idea was that the planets move on circles, and every circle is on this big sphere. And inside the sphere, there is an inscribed cube here. This is one of the platonic solids. And inside the cube, there is another sphere. And inside that sphere, we see a tetrahedron here. And there are also the dodecahedron, and the octahedron, and the icosahedron. All together, there are five platonic solids with six planets. This is clearly beautiful, clearly deep. It ties together deep mathematics, the fact that we have five and only five platonic solids. This is tied together with having six planets. What can be better than that, except that it's completely wrong? And Kepler himself realized that this is completely wrong. Uh, first, the planets do not move in circle, but they move on, ellip on ellipses. Second, if you look at the numbers, the numbers do not quite match. And Kepler realized that, that the numbers do not quite match this beautiful theory. And the real kicker was that we have more than, five plan more than six planets, although that was not known at the time of Kepler. So the lesson from that is that the question that Kepler tried to answer was just the wrong question. And that we shouldn't be looking for a deep mathematical reason why the radii of the orbits of the planets are what they are. The radii are what they are because this is how the solar system was formed. And they are, it could have been formed differently. And there are other solar systems around other stars, other stars surrounded by their own planets. And the radii of the planets are different. By now, we know a lot of such examples. We measure them. And we are not surprised that these are the numbers here. The numbers in our solar system are these numbers. And in other solar systems, they are different. So the lesson from that is that sometimes we just ask the wrong question. So I recall my sequence of events. We collect data, and then we look for the pattern. The next step is to understand the deep reason underlying the pattern. And that came with the work of Newton, where he understood classical mechanics and the gravitational force. This is the apple that dropped on his head. He had this insight that the moon goes around the Earth, and the Earth goes around the sun, and the apple dropped on his head, all because of the same force. And he replaced Kepler's pattern with the ellipsis with his basic laws of classical mechanics. In fact, at the beginning, this was whole called celestial mechanics because it was designed to explain the motion of stars. So this is really a clear success because now he doesn't need an ad hoc rule telling us that the planets move on ellipses. Instead, we have the basic laws of mechanics that, Kepler, that Newton understood, and he could derive the pattern. So this is clearly progress. We look for data, then we find the pattern, and then we look for the underlying reason behind the pattern. But there's an interesting twist in this story. Newton understood that if we just take one planet circling around the sun, we find this beautiful ellipse. But we have more planets, and the planets exert forces on each other. So Newton asked himself, is this system stable? Or can it be that as one planet moves around, it exerts some force on another planet? It could be small, but if it runs around enough time, it could change the orbit of the other planet and could eventually send the planet either to the sun where it would burn or totally outside the solar system. So he had a beautiful theory explaining the ellipses, but the system seemed to be unstable. Now, Newton was very concerned about that. And Newton was a very religious man. And here he made a turn, which is really surprising. After having the deep insight about classical mechanics and about the potential, uh, the gravitational potential or the gravitational force that moves the planets around, 
he decided that this system is unstable. And in order to stabilize that, he, this system, he needed to use divine intervention. So Newton had the idea that every once in a while, God comes in and moves the planets a little bit to restore them to this beautiful pattern with the ellipses. We look at it today, it's totally unimaginable how this genius, after figuring out all the hard and stuff work, had to use God to come and intervene, intervene with the equation. And there's a beautiful quote about that due to the historian Michael Hoskin about Newton's view. He said that God demonstrated his continuing concern for his clockwork universe by entering in what we might describe as a permanent servicing contract for the solar system. That every once in a while, it comes like, you know, in your heating system, you get the technician to come and make sure it will go through the winter. And that's what uh, Newton thought. And it's not some stupid physicist. Right? This is one of the greatest minds of mankind of all times. So this is my example of the sequence of events, collecting data, looking for the pattern, understanding the underlying reasoning. And the next step is understanding the parameters and worrying about their stability. And I would like to move to the second example. And this is chemistry. So again, people were fascinated with chemistry, properties of materials from ancient time, including the alchemists. At this point, I would like again to draw an interesting historical lesson. People often say that the alchemists who tried to convert ordinary materials into gold, into gold, these alchemists had research which was misguided. In fact, Newton spent most of his time doing alchemy. This was misguided by modern standards. But in fact, the alchemists did very, very helpful work, very useful that was used later. And it's often in science that we do very interesting work, find interesting discoveries for the wrong reason. We try to explain something, we find an explanation, the explanation fails, but this idea turns out to be useful elsewhere. We try to solve one problem, we fail to solve the problem, but we solve another. The way Columbus discovers, discovered America is a typical example. He tried to solve one problem, and I guess if he went to the funding agencies, they would have denied him funding after that because he failed. He did not find a shorter way to India. But this is common in science. Sometimes good work leads to interesting consequences, but not the consequences that one anticipated. In any event, these people collected a lot of data. And, <clears throat> and the next step came the pattern. The pattern came later with the work of Mendeleev. He divided materials into compounds and elements. And he found this pattern of the elements. He arranged them in the periodic table. In fact, it was very challenging at his time because he had to leave blanks, because some of these elements were not known at his time. So he left the blanks. This, would, of course, made the problem a lot more difficult. But this was a pattern that described a lot of the previous stuff that was discovered experimentally, all the data. And he summarized the data in this pattern. But he did not understand why we have the pattern. What's the underlying physics behind this pattern? That came later with the understanding of the structure of the atom and quantum mechanics. And I looked for a timestamp for when quantum mechanics started. And I think it's fair to say that this was the first Solvay conference in 1911. And here we see the participants sitting around the table, a lot of great names, Marie Curie, Henri Poincaré, Max Planck, Rutherford, Einstein, and others. So let's see if I can point. So this is Einstein, for example. Remember the face, because you will soon see him a little bit older. There's actually something amusing here. This gentleman here is Ernest Solvay. He's the philanthropist who gave the money and organized the meeting. But he could not come for this photo opportunity. So they left the chair empty, took the photo, took another photo of him, and glued it in. So I think this qualifies as the first Photoshop job. <laughs> so this was 1911. And it's really interesting to look at the proceedings of this conference because it's really fascinating. They were totally, totally confused. They asked the wrong questions. They did not understand the structure of the atom. There's, there's a whole beautiful, there are beautiful books describing this conference and how confused they were. And only 16 la years later, in 1927, this is the timestamp I took for the understanding of quantum mechanics. So during these 16 years, special relativity, general relativity, quantum mechanics were more or less fully understood. This is still an amazing group of people. 
including Schrodinger, Pauli, Heisenberg, Dirac, Bohr, Planck, Curie, Lorentz, and Einstein. So Einstein is here. You can see he aged a lot during these uh, 16 years. The others also aged. Marie Curie looks older. It's only 16 years, but these were really spectacular 16 years. They understood quantum mechanics. And as they understood quantum mechanics and the structure of the atom, they gave the underlying reason for Mendeleev's periodic table. So we had this thing that we started with data, then there was a pattern, and now there is an, the underlying reason that explains the pattern. But there are still remaining parameters. The parameters that still need to be understood, like the mass of the electron, the masses of the nuclei of the various elements, like this thing here in the middle. So this is my summary of the two historical examples. And now we'll go to the two standard models that we have today, one for particle physics and one for cosmology. And we'll see how we can draw lessons from these historical examples. So as I said, during the past few decades, two standard models emerged. And they describe physics beautifully. The model of particle physics is a nearly perfect model describing all physics at distances larger than the tiny, unimaginable short distances of 10 to the minus 19 meters. This is one tenth of a billionth of a billionth of a meter. It's much less than the atom, much less than the nucleus at the center of the, of the atom. And we really think we understand it, and I'll give more details soon. And the second model is cosmology. And again, we have a nearly perfect model describing all physics at large distances up to 10 to the 26 meters, the entire visible universe. This is a huge success. And we can cover, we cover the entire range of physics from 10 to the 26 to 10 to the minus 19th, and we think we understand everything here. Now, most physicists are not interested in fundamental physics. They are interested in working out the consequences of the fundamental laws. And this is fascinating. This is interesting, all of chemistry, all of biology. And most of physics is doing that. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on a tiny fraction of that, which is fundamental physics, understanding the basic laws. So we understand the basic laws, and we understand the consequences, at least in principle. The equations we need to solve might be very complicated, but at least we know what the equations are. And for biology or for chemistry, we don't have to go and change the rules of quantum mechanics for that, or at least so we think. So let me go into a little bit more detail into these models. So the standard model of particle physics has several elements. First, the principles. The principles are two of the revolutions of 20th century physics, quantum mechanics and special relativity, combined into a subject known as quantum field theory. Then we have matter particles. I've already talked about electrons. And inside the nucleus, there are protons and neutrons. And inside them, there are quarks. And there are many other particles. The details are not important. And we have forces. In the 19th century, we knew of the electromagnetic force. This is electricity and magnetism. And there are two 20th century forces, the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. And we have a bunch of parameters. These are numbers that we cannot explain, but we have to go and measure. These parameters are like the masses of the particles, the strength of the forces, and so forth. So in a little bit more detail, these are the matter particles. So the protons and the neutrons are made out of quarks. And there are several species of them. And they have funny names, up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. We talked about the electron. It's also a part of a big family, muon, tau, and particles called neutrinos in the standard model. And they can be arranged in a table, very much like the periodic table, where all the particles in the same row have the same electric charge. And all the particles in the column also have something in common. So this is very reminiscent of a Mendeleev's periodic table. We have this structure. It's the periodic table. And we have a new pattern to explain. We don't understand why we have this pattern. Recall the previous version of this problem. After Mendeleev, there was a periodic table putting all the elements in a table. It's a beautiful structure. We didn't understand why there was a structure, structure like that. And quantum mechanics came along and explained it. So we need now a new thing that will explain the origin of this pattern. So this is something we need to understand. And this is the last part of the standard model. It was discovered only in 20, 2012. This is the Higgs particle, particle responsible for giving masses 
to all the particles. This is the last parameter of the standard model that had to be measured, the mass of the Higgs particle. It weighs about 133 times the mass of the proton. So this was measured at CERN at the laboratory near Geneva. The name of the accelerator is LHC. I'll have more to say about that later. And the recent Nobel Prize in Physics was given to the two of the people who predicted this particle. This is Francois Anglaire and Peter Higgs. And notice that Francois Anglaire and I have the same tie. <laughs> this tie was actually designed by one of the greatest minds of 20th century physics, physicist, Gerhard de Toft. And this is a tie of the particles in the standard model. You can see there are all the particles of the standard model. And it was given as gift to the people who came to his 60th birthday. So this standard model is extremely successful. They are still the same thing, that we have parameters that we don't understand. We have to measure them. There are actually 18 parameters in the standard model, depending on how you count. So it's a relatively small number of parameters that still need to be measured. The standard model cannot predict these parameters. This is in input, input the standard model we give. But given this input, we can predict a lot of numbers, trillions and trillions of numbers. In fact, all of chemistry follows, at least in principle, from the standard model and using these 18 parameters. There are many experiments, and nothing contradicts the standard model. I'll qualify that statement slightly a little bit later. And this is unprecedented success. Most quantities cannot be calculated or cannot be measured because it's so difficult to measure or so difficult to calculate. But some of them can be both calculated and measured to incredibly high accuracy. Some of them can be measured to 10 significant digits. This is really spectacular. We have a calculation with those 10 significant digits. We measure something with 10 significant digits, and they all match. This shows that we really know what we are doing. And all the elements of the standard model are being tested this way. Of course, we should continue doing that and trying to push the envelope and add more digits to the calculation and more digits to the measurement to, to test the standard model under more extreme situations. So what are the op open problems? Or in Kelvin's terminology, what are the clouds over this model? Well, there are quite a few. First of all, I've e already emphasized that we have a pattern. And pattern needs to be explained, and we don't understand. We had these particles arranged in a periodic table, very much like Mendeleev's periodic table. But we don't have the analog of quantum mechanics that came along. This model is consistent with quantum mechanics. It, we need something else that will come along and will explain this pattern. Why are the particles arranged in this table? Why are there three forces and not four forces? What determines all these parameters in the standard model? There are these 18 numbers. We would like to have a deeper model that predicts these 18 numbers. The second problem is something I'll talk about a little bit more later, and it's the Higgs mass, the mass of this Higgs, the particle that was recently, the number that was recently measured, is unstable. Recall Newton's problem that some of the parameters in Kepler's description were unstable. The Higgs mass is equally unstable. I'll say something about that later. And finally, we have neutrino masses. I mentioned these particles called neutrinos. They have zero mass in the standard model. The mass has already has been measured. It's non-zero. So this is really in contradiction with the standard model. But that's not an immediate problem, because the mass is so small, we can predict at what length scale the underlying physics is. And the underlying physics behind neutrino masses is at very, very short distances, a lot smaller than the distances of the standard model. So the upshot of all that is that we know for sure there must be more physics beyond the standard model. First of all, we have to accommodate neutrino masses. But also, there are questions begging for an explanation. Where did these numbers come from? How do we ensure the stability of these parameters? So this is my summary of the standard model of particle physics. Collected data, we had pattern, and we have questions that push us forward. Yes? No, it's, it's a lot bigger than the Planck scale. We'll come to the Planck scale later. This is a lot distance which is a lot bigger than the Planck scale. This has nothing to do with gravity. And, but this is something that exists and needs to be addressed. The second model I want to discuss is the standard model of cosmology that describes the universe as a whole. 
and we have data for coming from various sources. First of them is kind of the two recent ones. There was a lot of sequence of events before, and I'm just looking at more recent history. The Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, and the other is the Planck Space Telescope. These are two satellites circling up there, looking at the sky. Uh, the Planck is a European uh, telescope by European Space Agency. And these two satellites look at the microwave radiation. We are surrounded by microwave radiation that is kind of the echo of the Big Bang. So the model tells us that there was a Big Bang, a big explosion that started the universe. And the universe expands and cools. And some radiation left over from the Big Bang can still be seen. And it is almost the same as we look across the sky. And this thing was measured with incredible accuracy. And it was always the same until a satellite called COBE found that it's not exactly the same. There are some fluctuations. This map, then there was W map that was more detailed. And the latest is the Planck Space Telescope. And there were many other experiments in between. So these are the fluctuations in this microwave background. So we measured the microwave radiation, a lot like microwave radiation in your microwave oven at home. And we look at different directions. And the temperature is almost the same, up to one part in, ten, in a 100,000. The temperature is almost the same. And this is the map. Some parts are small, are hotter. Some parts are colder. And this picture gives us a very, very beautiful and detailed picture of story of the history of the universe. So the history of the universe is summarized by such a picture. And I'll say more about that in a second. The second source of information is survey of faraway supernovae. Supernovae is the plural of supernova. It's a star that explodes very, very strongly. It outshines the galaxy it is in. And since it's so strong, we can see these supernovae, even if they are very, very far away, near the edge of the visible universe. And these three gentlemen looked at such far away supernovae, these explosions, measured the distance to them, and measures how far they recede from us. And they realize that not only is the universe expanding, in fact, the universe is expanding faster and faster. It's faster today than it was in the far past. And for that, they got the 2011 Nobel Prize. So putting all this data together, the standard model of cosmology emerged. And again, very much like the standard model of particle physics, it has principles. These are general relativity and Big Bang. General relativity, the theory of Einstein, the third revolution of 20th century physics, and the Big Bang, the fact that there was such an explosion and the universe expands. So these are the principles. And we have the composition of the universe. So we are here, ordinary matter, nearly 5% of the total uh, content of the universe. Dark matter is about 27%. This is another form of matter. We haven't discovered it yet, but it has to be there. And the rest, 68%, is dark energy. This is the force that causes this acceleration of the universe. So we have a lot of data. And we have a lot of data. And it agrees with, everything agrees with a simple model of the universe. And this is extremely satisfactory. So these principles together with a handful of parameters that need to be measured. When I say handful, it's literally five parameters, five or six, depending on how you count, that need to be measured. So these numbers are being measured. You feed that into this pattern that was discovered, and a lot of information follows with incredible accuracy. So we really know what we're doing. And a beautiful and coherent picture of the universe emerged. So what are the clouds going back to? Kelvin, there are these clouds, which would be viewed as the clues for the next step. There are still things we need to understand. What is this mysterious dark matter? There are ongoing searches for these. We believe these are some kind of particles. So far, we haven't discovered them. Maybe there's something wrong in our reasoning. Maybe we'll discover them. We'll see. What is this dark energy? What is, this, what is the origin of this force that accelerates the universe as it expands? We don't know the answer to that. And as before, there are parameters. We need to explain the parameters. We'd like to have another theory, which is deeper. And these parameters should be the output rather than the input.
the output of a deeper theory. And recently, there's been another excitement in this story, the idea of cosmic inflation. The idea of cosmic inflation is a period of extremely rapid expansion of the universe. Now, when we talk about the Big Bang, some people refer to the Big Bang as kind of extrapolating backwards to the explosion. In that language, inflation happened beforehand. Other people say Big Bang is the whole process at the beginning. But when the universe was very, very young, much less than a second, much less than a nanosecond, very young, there was a period of extremely rapid expansion. And there's a lot of evidence that this is right, but there's still many puzzles with it. And maybe you've seen in the news that, so this explains the patterns, and maybe you've seen in the news the recent excitement with a telescope in the South Pole called BICEP2, and it measured the polarization in this microwave radiation. So I said already that we are surrounded by radiation coming from all directions. This is the echo of the Big Bang. And just with Polaroid glasses, we can look at this radiation. And as kids do, they turn the glasses and the, the strength changes. So these people measured the strength of the signal as you vary, as you rotate the Polaroid glasses. And they found that the light is, this microwave radiation is polarized. And this gives us both very strong evidence for inflation, this picture of rapid expansion, and also gives us more parameters that we can measure and explain and so forth. This is extremely exciting. Many of us believe that if this is true, this will end up being one of the most exciting experimental discoveries in decades. This is really very fundamental for many reasons, but we have to wait. This is one measurement of one group. Maybe they did something wrong. So a lot of people are looking through the data now, making sure that what they did is right. This is a very difficult measurement. And there are also other experiments, similar experiments, different places, either from uh, satellites or on the ground, that they will repeat this measurement. And very soon, maybe in a year or two, we'll know whether this measurement is right or not. And if it's right, it's really exciting. If not, that's the way science progresses. We'll have to wait and see. So we should not open the champagne yet, but maybe we should buy it. So what are the questions? The biggest conceptual question is the following. We have two models. We would like to merge them. We have a model for particle physics and quantum mechanics operating at short distances. And we have another model of cosmology describing the universe as a whole. We would like to have one model would like to combine quantum mechanics and general relativity. What's the characteristic length where this thing should happen? Well, quantum mechanics and gravity are most relevant at the scale known as the Planck scale, and the gentleman in the back already asked me about it. It's extremely short distances, 10 to the minus 34 meter, much, much shorter than the distances we are familiar with in the standard model of particle physics. And in terms of energies, this is 10 to the 18 times the proton mass. And it's really interesting that this scale was already understood by Mr. Planck. And if you remember the two photos I had of the Solvay conferences, he was a well-established physicist already in 1911. So he did this calculation long ago. And he understood already then that this is the scale where quantum gravity would be important. So this is not some new thing of the last year or so. The fact that this is where basic physics is was already understood more than a century ago. So this is it. And where is it important? It's important to combine the two, the two models, the model of particle physics and quantum mechanics on one hand, and the model of cosmology on the other hand, when the universe was very, very small, when the size of the universe was about that length, 10 to the minus 34 meters, or when the universe was very young. At that point, things should be really exciting. All the peculiarities of quantum mechanics and cosmology should be visible. And this is where we'll understand creation. This is where we will understand the origin of the universe. So the creation of the universe, what does it mean to create the universe? This is this question. This is clearly a very fundamental and interesting question. How did the universe, how was the universe created? So we have to combine quantum mechanics and general relativity. 
And the best candidate for that, as of today, is a theory called string theory. This is a beautiful subject, and it's a, perhaps a subject of a different talk, maybe a little bit more than one talk, and I'm not going to say much about it, except to say that over the past several decades, there have been enormous progress with amazing new insights about the structure of the theory, but there are still very serious challenges. We do not understand the principles of the theory. We didn't understand it when it was first suggested, and we still don't understand it. We need experimental confirmation. The theory is most interesting and most dramatic at this Planck length, 10 to the minus 34, cent, 10 to the minus 34 meters, but we are very far from it experimentally. Experimentally, we are not there yet, so it's very hard to find clear experimental confirmation. And I think it's widely accepted that it might take a very long time to reach any of these goals. Reaching any of these two goals can take a long time, maybe decades, maybe even a century, maybe even more. But the payoff is enormous. The payoff is really understanding how the universe works. What is the fundamental principle of the universe? So we are not there yet. We've made a lot of progress. And I'm not going to uh, pursue it any further in this talk. But I'd like to talk about a somewhat easier problem. Maybe we don't want to tackle the most important question because it's so difficult. Let's go after a simpler question. We have all these parameters that we need to explain. So the idea is that if we have a theory that it has some parameters, these are these input numbers that we have to measure in order to predict many other numbers, we should look for a deeper theory so that these numbers that are input today will be the output of a different, a, another deeper structure. So that's the general rule. We always have to go for deeper ideas. So the existence of these parameters already tells us that something, there's something deep we don't understand that will eventually predict these numbers. So we should look for a model which has fewer parameters, something deeper, such that the parameters of the standard model, these 18 num parameters in particle physics and five or six parameters in cosmology, are output rather than input. So recall our theme that, as in the past, we have parameters. We feed them at the beginning. We collect more data. We find the pattern in the parameters. We understand what underlies it, and on and on we go. So we should go with that. And ultimately, we would like to hope that we find a fundamental theory that explains everything, and there are no parameters at all. This vision was put forward very eloquently by Albert Einstein. He said that there are no arbitrary constants. Nature is so constituted that it is possible logically to lay down such strongly determined laws that within these laws only rationally determined constants occur. Not constants, therefore, whose numerical values could be changed without destroying the theory. In other words, what Einstein wanted was kind of one beautiful equation, and there are some coefficients in the equation, 3, pi, 7. And these numbers have a value that we shouldn't measure. We shouldn't measure them because the equation makes sense only if these numbers have the value they do. The equation does not make sense if these numbers have different values. So th this was his vision, that we should look for a theory without parameters at all. Well, we should keep this goal in mind. It's very important. We should keep this goal in mind. But before we do that, let's look at for a more qualitative question. So we try to find some easier question, a question that we can really address. So I would like to explain something qualitative. And that is the overall scales of the numbers. And here, there is something very peculiar. In particle physics, we said that the basic scale is the mass of the Higgs particle or the mass of the other particles. And on the other hand, the fundamental scale in physics is this Planck length. And the ratio between them is 10 to the 16th. So how come, if the basic scale of nature is the Planck length, how come we get particles which are 16 orders of magnitude smaller. This really begs for an explanation. Where did this small number, 10 to the minus 16 in the ratio, where did this small number come from? In the context of cosmology, the problem is even more dramatic. Because here the question is, why is the observed universe so big? The basic, law, the basic laws of nature are determined by physics at the Planck length. And the universe is 60 orders of magnitude bigger than the Planck length. In other words, there is this 
dark energy that we talked about, the, lab, the amount of dark energy, dark energy density, is again 60 orders of magnitude different than the Planck length. So where did the number like 10 to the minus 60 come from? In fact, for technical reasons, we should square these things. So here we have a question of 32 orders of magnitude, and here we have a question of 120 orders of magnitude. Where did such small numbers come from? This is a qualitative question that one day we would like to understand. How come the theory that was formulated at the Planck length spits out answers which are 120 orders of magnitude smaller than uh, what we would expect? In fact, the problem is even more severe than that. I want to remind you of Newton's question of the stability of the parameters. We'd like to understand first where this ratio of scales come from. Why is the universe so big? But the second question we'd like to understand is, are these parameters stable? The same way that Newton was concerned about the stability of the solar system. So Newton was concerned about the stability of the solar system. And now we should be equally concerned about the stability of the Higgs mass, or the stability of the dark energy. More technically, we want to ensure that if we have a deeper theory, so that these parameters that we have today, like the mass of the Higgs or the, energy, the uh, dark energy, these are output of another th theory. We'd like to make sure that if we change the parameters of the deeper theory slightly, the outcome does not change too much. And this is this question of the stability. And <clears throat> Newton was concerned about such stability, and he wanted to use divine intervention. So maybe we have something like this here. Maybe God carefully designed the parameters such as to give us this hierarchy. Otherwise, we would like to have the alternative is to find a more natural explanation. And indeed, this question is known as the naturalness problem. So some parameters in the standard models, in both of them, seem to be fine-tuned. Very, very special. Maybe God did it. Maybe there is another explanation. Here is an example that I stole off the internet. So you walk in the forest, and you see this configuration of rocks. I'm sure this never happened to you. You never walked around and saw such set of rocks. Why not? Well, it's very uh, unlikely that this thing was just formed by accident. This doesn't look right. So, so the first question, if you do find such a thing, the first question is, who put it there? Looks like somebody was there and put the rocks together. The second puzzle about that is not just that it's there. Imagine there was a child who played and put the rocks together. This setup is extremely unstable. Imagine there's a little bit of wind, or an animal passes by, or a bird sits on top of that. This whole thing would seem immediately collapse. So this thing is first looks strange, looks unnatural. And not only does it look unnatural, it's also unstable. So what could be the explanation? So this structure is unlikely to be found because it looks unstable. So imagine we did find such a structure. I think a reasonable thing to think is that, well, maybe these rocks are actually connected to each other. Maybe there is a rod inside, some metal rod. In fact, there's a lot of artwork that looks unstable, but the artist first put it very carefully, and second, the artist made sure that it's connected well so that it doesn't collapse. So it looks unstable, but maybe there is a stabilizing mechanism that we don't yet understand that stabilizes this collection of rocks. So going back to these hierarchy problems, these scales that we want to understand, I can have several logical options. What are the logical options? First, maybe our reasoning is wrong. And that's something we always have to keep in mind in science. People make mistakes. Maybe there's something we overlooked. Maybe there's something we don't understand. Many people thought about it for a long time. The problem is still there, and we don't know what to make of it. So there's a serious problem. One possibility is we made a mistake. I do not know how to proceed with that. So let's put that aside. The second possibility is there's a stabilizing mechanism. Recall the connected rocks. So reasoning is wrong is very similar to what happens with Newton's concern about the solar system. The solar system is indeed unstable, but it is stable enough over the lifetime of the solar system. This option, the stabilizing mechanism, 
we call the connected rocks. There is, a, there is a stabilizing mechanism, but it's not obvious. And the third possibility is that this is the wrong question. And here we call Kepler's story with the sizes of the orbits. Maybe this is just the wrong question. So putting the first option aside, because I do not have anything useful to say about it, this, of course, would be the most dramatic possibility that we're just completely wrong. We are backing up the wrong tree. But putting this aside, I would like to say something about these two other options, a stab new stabilizing mechanism and the wrong question. So let's say, talk a little bit about the new stabilizing mechanism. If there is a new stabilizing mechanism, a mechanism that explains the mass of the Higgs particle, there must be new physics at nearby energies, at energies close to the mass of this particle, that we need energies of the same order of magnitude as what we would like to stabilize, maybe a factor of 10 more than that. And indeed, there are experiments looking for such mechanisms, or for anything else for that matter. And there could be new particles that will be discovered at the LHC. This is this accelerator in the laboratory called CERN. This is Large Hadron Collider. CERN is the European Nuclear Research Center. And near Geneva, this is a picture of the accelerator. It is shut down now for a period of two years for an upgrade. And it's going to start working again in about a year from today at roughly twice the previous energy and with much higher intensity. And therefore, it will have much higher reach. And it's quite possible that it will find new physics, physics that perhaps will explain this hierarchy, will stabilize this hierarchy. A leading candidate for stabilizing the hierarchy is the idea of supersymmetry. And, but there could be also be something else, maybe something else we didn't think about that will stabilize this hierarchy. So the LHC, as I said, is shut down, but soon it will work again. At the moment, there, isn't, there is no experimental sign for any new particle beyond the standard model. People look very carefully at the LHC, and they haven't found anything beyond the standard model. There will be another run. Option one, they will find something. That will be very exciting. Option two, they don't find anything new. And the standard model would just stand as it has been until now. Well, perhaps something will be found in the next run. We don't know. That's why it's so exciting, as I said at the beginning. But let's assume that nothing else is found. So they run the LHC, explore shorter distances, and they don't find anything beyond the standard model. This is perf a perfectly reasonable possibility. What then? Well, then we face this hierarchy problem again. What stabilizes this parameter? What stabilizes it? And as I said before, maybe we're completely wrong. And they, we don't have to worry about that. Or two, there is a stabilizing mechanism, but imagine it's not found. So we are left with only a third option. And the third option is that this is the wrong question. And again, I remind you of Kepler's question of trying to understand the orbits of the planets. This is just the wrong question. And the word that comes about in this context is the multiverse. We say that the universe is much bigger than we think. And I use universe with capital U. It's much bigger than we think, much big, more than what we see. And there are really many universes with lowercase u. We happen to live in one of them. And there are different laws of physics in the different universes. Just as the, planets of the, ob the orbits of the planets are different around different stars, there are different universes with different laws of physics. First, there could be different parameters. So these parameters we are trying to explain, like the mass of the electron, they have one value here, another value there. And this is just not a good question to ask, because we just live here. And that's why what, this is why we measure this value. We could even have different spectrum of particles, different elementary particles, different number of forces. We could perhaps even have different number of dimensions in the different universes. We don't know. This is a possibility that is being entertained. If this is true, and we don't know that this is true, but it could very well be true, this is a revolution of the scale of the Copernican revolution. So first people thought that the Earth is special. We live in this Earth, and it is special. Then the sun is at the center, and we are just circling around the sun. But the sun is special because it's the, the center of our universe. Then it turns out that there are many stars, 
And we are just circling in one planet around one star. And that's in our galaxy. And our galaxy is not any special galaxy. There are tons and tons of galaxies. So we live on one planet around one star in one galaxy. And maybe the next step is also logical. And we live in one universe. And there are many other universes. So this is clearly a logical possibility. But obviously, many physicists, including myself, are reluctant to accept it. Reluctant to accept it because this is a really drastic change in the way we think about physics. And the reason it is so drastic is that it's not clear how to think about physics in such a setup. If we have so many universes, and we live only in one of them, and we can do experiments only in one of them, and the other universes are not visible, what is physics? What does it mean? What are the right questions to ask in such a setup? How do we proceed? Is it even meaningful to ask questions about the other universes if we cannot perform any measurements to test them? Our universe is not special. If our universe is not special, what selects it? Why do we live with such a universe? Should we live in the generic universe? Or should we live in the most likely universe? Or perhaps we should only look for uh, universes which can support life so that we can ask such a question. This is the entropic reasoning. This is all very confusing and very troublesome, but it might very well be right. This might end up being the right answer. If it's true, it's clearly exciting. If it's wrong, we would like to know why it's wrong. So this is the summary with the takeaway lesson. If you fell asleep, this is the time to wake up. <laughs> Everything you missed will be on one or two slides. Uh, we've had a long journey through centuries of physics, starting with the Babylonians, going through 19th century, 20th century, 21st. Till the end, we are even speculating about the future, maybe 22nd century. At the moment, we have two extremely successful standard models, one for particle physics and one for cosmology. The particle physics model addresses physics at short distances, and the cosmology model describes the universe as a whole. It's completely clear, without any doubt, and you cannot find a single physicist who would disagree with this statement, that there must be new physics beyond these models. This is not the end of the story. And we are not at the end of science. And there is no crisis. There are cl very clear questions that we have to address. And they address physics beyond these models. And there are different kinds of questions that we have to address. One of them is the challenge to unify the two models. This is clearly an ongoing, this is clearly an interesting and important question. There's been a lot of progress in that. And perhaps a simpler problem is to explain all these parameters. We talked about the small number of parameters that still need to be measured. Parameters that exhibit a pattern that needs an explanation. Parameters that exhibit huge hierarchies. Some of them are extremely small. Some of them even appear to be unstable. So these are the questions that we need to address. And the LHC is going to give us input. So this is the best of all worlds. We have very clear, sharp puzzles that we need to understand. And experimental input will soon be coming in, helping us addressing these questions. So what will the option be? One option in the near future, we will find a mechanism that stabilizes this hierarchy. Alternatively, as I said before, some physicists think that these are just the wrong questions, and we live in a multiverse or in a huge universe. Many there are many universes that are different from each other, and all these parameters that we need to explain are environmental parameters, and their values are just accidents. These are the values here; they have different values elsewhere, and this is not just a question that we should really be thinking about. So in summary of that, these are clearly interesting issues that we should address. And we expect new, new insight in the near future that will guide us in the research. So we asked at the beginning of the talk, where is fundamental physics heading? And the answer is, we do not know, but it's guaranteed to be exciting. Thank you. <laughs>